Um, if you could turn in your Bibles, please, or uh, switch on your eye Bibles um, to Ezekiel chapter 36. That would be great. I'm going to read a few verses uh, from verse 22 of Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Let's pray briefly before we look at that together. Our gracious Father, when you looked at your people Israel all those years ago, you found resistance in their hearts, and they killed the prophets that you sent to them. O oh Lord, what do you see when you look at us? We pray that you would find this morning open and receptive hearts to your truth, ready and obedient wills to fulfill your purposes. And we pray for the grace of your Holy Spirit to be upon each of us now that your word may produce its intended effect in each one of us according to your will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When you reach my sort of age, uh, you discover that the NHS really promotes the whole idea of looking after your heart. Um, at least they did until COVID became the sole preoccupation and every other condition went on the back burner. But prior to lockdown, those of us of the bus pass generation would regularly have our local GP or our uh, NHS trust bombard us with warnings about our cholesterol levels, about our salt intake, uh, about our need to give up smoking, so as to look after your heart. And on the positive side, we are encouraged to walk more, to drink less, uh, to jog regularly, or to do some other form of aerobic exercise. And we're provided with all sorts of advice and tips about how to reduce our stress levels. All of which is indicative, isn't it? of how we've become an increasingly heart-conscious society. 
And I suppose the reason is, is quite simple. Uh, because regardless of whether you get coronavirus or whatever other health conditions you may suffer from, all people, without exception, ultimately die from cardiac arrest when the heart stops beating. And to have a strong and a fit heart is an important thing. But Besides the NHS, the Bible is also very concerned about the fitness of our hearts. But the heart spoken of in Scripture is not the heart that pumps blood, but it's the inner self. Everything that makes up what we are and who we are. It includes our intellect, and our imagination, our will, our memory, our thoughts, our emotions, and intentions. And when Scripture says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, it's referring to the totality of the human personality. Um, if, if you think of um, some of the um, terminology which the Bible uses to uh, uh, assess our heart attitudes, um, it speaks about sometimes being broken-hearted, faint-hearted, or hard-hearted, none of which we would like to be descriptions of ourselves. But then you also get kind-hearted, whole-hearted, tender-hearted, and heartfelt. And those are words which imply that a change of heart has taken place. And today what I want to focus on is the change within a person themselves when someone becomes a Christian. What kind of change occurs on the inside of us when we've put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And this is, is what in the New Testament would be called being born again. Or another image it uses is that of becoming a new creation. But today I, I'm wanting to home in on, on the picture, the analogy uh, of regeneration that's not from the New Testament, but it's from the Old Testament. And the picture I want to look at is that one in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, where it talks about a heart transplant. God says to his people, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now, many of you will know that much of my life was spent in Zimbabwe and South Africa. And uh, one of my abiding memories as uh, a young boy was something that happened in South Africa that made world headlines. Now, there weren't many things in South Africa that made headlines all across the world at that time. But this one did. It was the world's first heart transplant. Do any of you remember that happening? Yeah. Yep, David, you've, you, you've... That's right. That, that was, I was going to do a quick test of, of, of your general knowledge. 
And um, to start with, it, that, that was the simple question. Yeah. Who was it who performed the pioneering operation? It was Dr. Chris Barnard. Yeah. Um, slightly more difficult is, can you remember what year that it happened? It was in the 60s. It was in the 60s indeed. Was 67, yes, you can read the small print there quite well <laughs> on the screen, actually. <laughs> yeah, you read, if you read the small print even more, probably you might see the answer to the th my third question I was going to ask you. Do you know who the recipient was? Uh, the first man to get uh, a new heart. Um, his name was actually Louis Washkansky. Might be familiar once you've heard it again. And so the, the very first medical heart transplant was performed over 50 years ago. But God's promise of a spiritual heart transplant was made over two and a half thousand years ago. Now, for a successful heart transplant, um, I want to, to share what I think are the three key things that are necessary um, before that can happen effectively. Um, the first thing at all is that we need a diagnosis, we need a doctor, and we need a donor. And those are three things I just want to look at briefly in turn this morning. Um, first of all, we need a diagnosis. And the diagnosis you get in verse 26 in, in this chapter is that we have a serious problem. Our hearts are made of stone. In, in biblical language, the word heart doesn't just mean um, the large muscular pumping thing in our chest that keeps our blood flowing. Um, it, it's just got that so much wider meaning in the Bible, and it's linked with your spirit. And often in the Bible, the word heart and spirit are used interchangeably. And so when David prays in the Psalms, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Um, he's not asking for two things, a clean heart and a right spirit, but one thing, to be completely clean on the inside. A person's heart and a person's spirit are essentially the same thing in, in biblical language. And, and its use of this word, heart, um, cl uh, is close to the meaning of, of the center or the core um, as in the phrase when we, we still use today about um, the heart of the matter. Um, and in relation to people, it means the inner being, the whole of your inner person. Um, the heart, biblically speaking, is the seat of our personality, of our emotional state, of our intellectual activities and of our will and volition. Your heart is who you are. And uh, in Proverbs, in chapter 4 and verse 23, uh, it... Um, no, I've got the, wrong, got the wrong verse up on the screen there. Never mind, we'll come on to that one. Um, but it says uh, in Proverbs... Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. I think I'm one behind, that's why. Above all, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. And sometimes modern usage does reflect... I think the, the wider biblical meaning of this word heart, when we talk about someone's heart desire, something that they long for with their whole being, or we talk about giving someone our wholehearted support, 
meaning that we back them without any reservations. I wholeheartedly endorse Jose Marino as the Spurs manager. Or we describe people as having a change of heart when they stop behaving in one way and they start to follow a different path. And all of those uses of the word heart embrace far more than just the pumping mechanism thing in our chests. They sum up our whole being, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And that's how the Bible uses this word. And so when the Bible diagnoses that our hearts are made of stone, we can see that we've got a very serious problem because it affects our whole being. And as far as God is concerned, our hearts are just lumps of rock. They're not doing their job. They're not taking God's life-giving essence and, and radiating it round our entire inner being. And if our physical hearts were made of stone, we'd be stone dead, wouldn't we? Um, I, I was reading not that long ago um, uh, of uh, an athlete, a guy uh, called Dan Olson, who's a marathon runner and he's a long distance cyclist. And he has also had a heart transplant. And here was somebody who thought that his athletic lifestyle would ensure that he had a healthy body. But at 38, he was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, which is a, a weakening and a, a thickening of the heart muscle. And his heart was damaged beyond repair. And he needed a heart transplant. And I mention that because when we become believers in the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, um, that it's because we have a kind of spiritual cardiomyopathy. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, we are darkened in our understanding and separated from the life of God due to the hardening of our hearts. And that is the point of the picture. Towards God, we're by nature stone cold dead, rock hard. We don't love him, we don't believe in him, we don't trust him, we don't delight in him, we don't obey him by nature. And so as far as God's concerned, our hearts are as responsive as rocks. That is the way we're born. Not one of us was born with a heart that is alive to God. Ever since the fall, we've inherited a defect which has left us with a heart problem, a heart made of stone, an inner being that is dead towards God. And the prophet Jeremiah, who was a contemporary um, of Ezekiel's, says this, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, beyond cure. Uh, which is why the commonly quoted piece of folk wisdom, you know, people will tell you, have you had people tell you, oh, just follow your heart, is not necessarily good advice on that basis, is it? Because your heart is irreparably damaged by this disease called sin. 
And Jesus pinpointed the origin of that in, in Matthew's Gospel in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 15. He says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. That's what our heart is like. And it cannot be cured. We cannot make ourselves alive to God. We cannot make our cold, hard, stone-like hearts beat with, with warmth and responsiveness to God any more than we can take a rock and make it live. And you know, today, if you, you, you go into W.H. Smith or Waterstones or wherever, there are any number of books you'll find about spirituality and, and any number of um, religions promising self-fulfillment and spiritual enlightenment. Any number of exercises decided to give us what is called spiritual centeredness. They're all missing the point. If it weren't so serious, it would be funny. A vast army of con merchants getting rich by deluding people that they can make rocks live. But no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we manage to be, no matter how much we try to pray, we can't cure that fundamental problem. We have hearts of stone. A heart of stone can never know God, any more than a rock can be your friend. Our problem is so serious that there is only one hope. We need a heart transplant. We need to have our incurably diseased old hearts removed and replaced with a new, living, responsive, beating heart towards the Lord. That is what regeneration is. And that's what God, through Ezekiel, promises when he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So that is the diagnosis. We need a heart transplant. How do we get one? Well, that's where the doctor comes in. The second of my D's. Open heart surgery is not something that we can perform on ourselves. Open heart surgery is something that has to be done to us by somebody with very special skills and training and equipment. It is absurd to think that I could open up my chest, whip out my heart, stick in a new one, sew it all up again, and survive to tell the tale. Medical science is good, but it's never going to be that good. And in the same way, there is no way I can carry out a spiritual heart transplant on myself. I can never make myself a Christian. I might call myself a Christian. I might act like a Christian as best I can. I might believe that I am a Christian. But unless God has actually performed heart surgery on me, I will never be a Christian. My heart will remain stone cold dead. I'll never be able to know God. So, no, we actually need a doctor to perform the transplant. And here, 
in Scripture, we have the wonderful news that God says he will do that. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you, removing your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh. And actually, I don't know if you, if you noticed when I read those verses, it comes at the end of a long list of I will statements, starting verse 24. Um, you can see, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you. I will, verse 25, sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart. I will remove from you your heart of stone. Verse 27, I will put my spirit in you. These are God's promises to his people. Now, God's people, Israel, at this time, were pretty much at their lowest point in their history. God had punished them for their persistent and their gross disobedience and idolatry. And he'd taken them away from their land. He'd taken them away from their temple. He'd given them over completely to a pagan nation. There was nothing they could do to save themselves. But finally, to his broken people, he promises restoration. More than that, he promises regeneration. He will make a new start with his people. And when we accept the truth of God's description of our spiritual condition, and we don't try and hide it, and we can confess and offer our broken wounded and contrite hearts to God. He does a miracle. And that's something to do not just once, but many times over. It is both a pre-surgical condition and post-operative maintenance, if I can put it like that. With new hearts, hearts of flesh, and God's own spirit within them, we're able to start a deep, genuine relationship with him. And a relationship that's no longer characterized by guilt or by shame or by failure, but a relationship of love and a relationship of responsiveness. You will be my people and I will be your God says in verse 28. And that is the relationship that you and I, if we're Christians, we have with the Lord. He has taken away that heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh. We've contributed nothing except that heart of stone itself. The doctor has performed the whole heart transplant himself. So that's two of the elements that we need in the heart transplant, a diagnosis and a doctor. And the third missing element is the donor. Where will we get this living, beating heart of flesh? Who will it come from? Uh, this guy, Dan Olson, I mentioned, his donor was a 15-year-old girl from a car. She was a car accident victim. But that tragedy allowed Dan to receive a new life. And when he was interviewed quite recently, he said, I think of my donor every day because I want to show her family all that that gift has enabled me to do. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? Jesus didn't just come to do surgery on your old heart. 
He came to give you a new one. He came to give you a heart transplant. And the heart that you get is his. He died so that you could have his heart. And just as the tragic death of that teenage girl allowed Dan Olson to get a new physical heart, the tragic death of Jesus on the cross allows you to get a new spiritual heart. Because Jesus is the only person who was born into this world who did not suffer the birth defect of a heart of stone. The son of God rather than a son of Adam. Only Jesus had a heart that was fundamentally warm to God, a heart of flesh. You know, when a, a medical heart transplant is done, we know that there must have been a death. The donor gives life to another at the expense of their own life, usually in tragic circumstances. But so it is also with a spiritual heart transplant. The donor had to die. Jesus voluntarily died so that we might have life. His heart of flesh was so good, so sufficient, that it is sufficient for hundreds of millions of believers in this world, replacing their hearts of stone. That's one of the pictures that the Bible gives for what happened at the cross. Because of Jesus' death, his heart can now live within us. Jesus becomes our heart donor and gives us the hope of life. So that the Apostle Paul can write uh, in his letter to the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless this heart transplant has taken place, unless Jesus is in us, his heart of flesh replacing our heart of stone, then we're not in the faith. We're simply not Christians. So that is the message from these verses this morning. That it's vital to have that heart transplant. Have you let God have your heart of stone and replace it with his heart of flesh? You only need one heart transplant if the transplant has been done, it will not fail. It may not always seem like it's successful in this life. Because the process of removing our heart of stone is not fully complete until we die. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit, your heart is alive because of righteousness. The work's not yet complete in one sense. We have to put up with our dead old stony hearts for a while yet. There is a fight within us between the old and the new. But if Christ is in you, then the new heart of flesh gives you life. And one day the dead heart of stone will be completely gone. And I, I can remember, good many years ago, hearing Professor Chris Barnard speaking on the radio about his successes 
in surgery. And he, he remarked with obvious satisfaction that some of his patients had lived a further 10 years or more. And he was thrilled to have saved a person's life for 10 years. But the kind of life that Jesus saves you for is eternal life. He was willing to die to give you his heart. Believe me, if you ever get a heart from a surgeon, it's not new. It's second hand. <coughs> Only God can put a new heart within you. And of course in the medical world there is a great shortage of suitable hearts available for transplanting. And because of this many people die. But this is not a problem with the Lord. A new heart is available to anyone who will confess their need and ask Jesus to give them so much more than Professor Chris Barnard ever could. Now when you have a physical heart transplant, your body needs ongoing monitoring. You need a, a daily dose of anti-rejection medication. And it's the same with us. We need to study the Word of God daily. We need to spend time in prayer with Him daily so that the old flesh doesn't flare up and reject the new heart. And the other thing, of course, is that after surgery we need to have periodic checkups. We need to be willing to open our lives to God's inspection and scrutiny. Or in the words of Psalm 139, probably very familiar to you, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And so the obligation for us if we are Christians is not to follow the old heart of stone but to follow the new heart of flesh which God provides for us. The heart that delights in him and in prayer and in his word and in his people. Follow that heart with all your heart Perhaps you know that maybe that isn't a description that um, you can really uh, resonate with. Perhaps that's somebody here or even somebody watching online. Um, you've never handed yourself over to God in that way so that he can do his regenerating work his heart transplanting work in your life. And earlier on in, in this uh, account in, in Ezekiel, God has urged his people uh, to, he said, rid yourselves of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? And he is asking the same question today. Why will you die? Why won't you come to God for a new heart and a new spirit and live? You don't need to strive to be good. Um, our, our reading earlier, I think, made it perfectly clear that the people of Israel were wicked. And yet, God offers them the same promise. And that is the point, isn't it? It is the spiritually sick, all of us, who need this transplant. It's not a case of being good. If you were in a doctor's surgery tomorrow, and he said, here's the bad news, your heart is failing, it's riddled with disease, you're certain to die, but the good news is, 
that a perfect replacement has just come in. Would you agree to a transplant? What would you say? It'd be strange to say anything else, but doctor, where do I sign? <laughs> well, the donor heart is available. Praise his name. The doctor's waiting to perform the operation. Do you agree with the diagnosis? Will you come to the doctor? Will you receive what he's provided as a donor? I want to close with a wonderful promise which comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 19 where it says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now most of us, I guess, probably feel that our hearts aren't yet as co fully committed to him as they should be. But what God seeks is a heart committed to being committed to him. A responsive, repentant heart with a mindset that invites the searching inspection of the Holy Spirit. Is that you? Is that me? Because God wants to strengthen you. And give you that new heart. And as he does so, he'll bless you, give you abundant life, make you fit for his presence. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Just to echo the words of the psalm writer. Create in me a new heart, O God. And put a right spirit within me. Because Jesus has done it for me. On the cross. Thank you. Amen.